Hello, everyone. This is the 22nd episode of the Soccer Nostalgia Talk podcast. As always, this is Sean from Los Angeles, and I'm joined by Paul from Shipley in England. For this episode, we welcome back Mr. David Stewart of the Scotland Episodes Football Magazine and Mr. Clark Gillies as we discuss the matches of the Scotland national team for the 1983 and 84 season. Welcome back, David. Welcome back, Clark. Good to have you back. So last time we left off in the summer of 1983, where Scotland had just taken part in a season-ending tour of Canada. As far as the 1984 Euros, they were more or less eliminated. It was considered a lost or a transitional season. At this point, the long view were the 1986 World Cup qualifiers that were to take place in a year's time in the fall of 1984. This entire 1983-84 season was nothing more than experimentation with nothing really at stake. But there were still a couple of European qualifiers left that would be part of this preparation process. Otherwise, Scotland didn't have much to play for this season. We start off the season with a friendly on September 21st, 1983 at Hampton Park, when Scotland took on the South American opponent, Uruguay. I think maybe the last time they had played one another must have been during the 1954 World Cup, but I could be wrong. No, they so, played, they oh, they played, played in 1962 at Hamden. Oh, they did? Oh, they okay. Ended up in a wee bit of a brawl. Um, the Uruguay won 3-2, but it was one or two wee fights. Right. <laughs> oh, of course, part. yeah. <laughs> that was like at least 20 years since they had met one another, I guess. So for this match... Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton of Aberdeen in goal. Richard Goff of Dundee United. Arthur Alveston, Man United. The Aberdeen duo of Willie Miller and Alex McLeish. Graham Souness capping the side from Liverpool. Kenny Daglish from Liverpool. Debutant Paul McStay of Celtic Glasgow. He would be replaced by Aberdeen's Neil Simpson in the 77th minute. Frank Garvey of Celtic started. He'd be replaced by another debutant, David Dodds of Dundee United in the 17th minute. Uh, I presume he must have been injured. You had John Wark of Ipswich and John Robertson of Derby County. And for this match, Scotland were wearing the red kit, even though they were the home team. Well, we'll get back to this. Uh, this season, Scotland actually wore this red kit a few times as well, which I think is like a collector's uh, item for most Scotland fans. I'm, it's I'm, a well-loved talk. So, yeah, I think it's got a bit of a cult fall on that one. The red kit? Yes. Yeah, not really greatly remembered, but it's, people see it. They always say, oh, that's a good. It's always right. people can say, oh, I wish I'd wore right. red now. Yeah, I think they've, they've wore it. I'm not sure if it was the first time, but I, I remember they were against Israel in a World Cup qualifier around 1981. Mm, that was was that the kit. first time? That was a different kit. Oh, that was a different kit. Oh, yeah, the design. It was Ombro, yeah, but a different kit. Oh, yeah, you're yeah. right, you're right, yeah. So anyway, as far as the match itself, in the 24th minute, the debutant David does that we mentioned, he was fouled in a box and uh, John Robertson would score from a penalty kick. In the second half, David Dodds himself would score and give Scotland a 2-0 win. Now, as far as another key point in the match, Uruguay's Jorge Barrios was sent off in the 27th minute for tripping the referee. This was a sign of things to come in three years' time when some of these players would face one another as well in the World Cup in 1986. What do you guys remember from this match? I don't actually remember at the time, but I was looking at it and just seeing the arguments that's going on after the penalty. It, it, it was quite a soft penalty, I'd have to say, by the looks of it. Um, but apparently he did try and trip the ref and shouted at him a few <laughs> choice names, no doubt, as well, you know. So it wasn't a surprise. Um, one of the things Jock Steen says in the paper the next day is they didn't come to play, you know which a few years down the line, Ernie Walker, I think it's calls him a disgrace uh, at the 86 World Cup. So yeah. it wasn't unusual yeah. for Uruguay at that point. Um, interesting things like 
John Robertson, he's been out for two years. He's obviously moved from Forest to Derby County, but he would only get one more game after this as well. You're right about Frank McGarvey going off. He got injured. He had a gash in his knee. There was blood everywhere, apparently. So that was Dodds coming on. He obviously made an impact. He was there for the penalty and he was there for the goal as well. But he was a he was a good player, but he wasn't international good league, flash, shall we say. Good league player. Good Scottish league player, I. When he signed for Aberdeen, it was... And Rangers. He was, he was there. Yeah. yeah, he eventually signed for Aberdeen. I think he was Alex Ferguson's last Aberdeen signing and he was just a bit of an odd one, but he was kind of a good Aberdeen career, but he was just nothing special, really. He was known as the Elephant Man for, for uh, not being very good looking, shall we say. I think Charlie Nicholas is missing from this match. He had just joined Arsenal under a blaze of publicity, but uh, I'm assuming maybe he probably was on match fit at this time, perhaps. Obviously, Mick Stee's coming as well for his first game. Oh, um, yes, but- yes. Quite a lot of the newspapers were quite happy with his performance and just, you know, he played well. He had fitted right in, it seems, uh, created a couple of chances. Um, and he's coming it, in off just off the back of the European Championships a year before, so... Quite oh, a yes, you mentioned that last time, yeah. The, the under-20s, right? The World Cup? Yep. Yes. Yep. Interestingly, though, this uh, Uruguay side would actually win the Copa America in a couple of months against Brazil. There was some talent in the side, but there was also uh, the stereotypical fiery temper that uh, the world would witness in a few years' time. This would be the only friendly for the fall campaign. The next match was a European qualifier, again at Hampton Park on October 12th, against Belgium, who had more or less qualified at this time. And this draw would guarantee their qualification. For this match, Jock Steen selected Jim Layton of Aberdeen and Goal, Richard Goff, Arthur Alvison of Man United, McLeish and Miller. Miller was capping the side this time because Graham Sunes was missing. You had John Wark of Ipswich. He'd be replaced by Roy Aitken of Celtic in the 80th minute. You had Kenny Dalglish, Paul McStay. Charlie Nicholas back in the side from Arsenal. He'd be replaced by Frank McGarvey of Celtic in the 74th minute. You had James Bett of Belgian side Lokeren and John Robertson of Derby County playing his 28th and final cap for Scotland. Also, let me go through the Belgium lineup as well. Jean-Marie Pfaff of Bayern Munich in goal. Eric Gerrits, the captain of the side from AC Milan of Italy. Luke Milkamps of Varagam, Walter Muse of Standard Liège. He'd be replaced by Michel De Wolf of Ghent in the 76th minute. Michel Vintak of Standard Liège. Frankie Verkautren of Anderlecht. Francois Vanderlecht of Lokeren, formerly of Westham. Nico Clayson of Serang, future Tottenham player. Eddie Wurdekers of Watershai the late Ludo Quek of Inter Milan, and Jan Sulemans of Club Bruges. Belgium would take the lead in the 30th minute through Frankie Verkautren. Scotland would fight back in the second half, and Charlie Nicholas would tie the match in the 50th minute. The Belgians gladly took the tie to guarantee their qualification. As far as the match itself, he did have a feel that I'm sure that nothing was really at stake. Well, I think Belgium knew beforehand because I think the other game had kicked off earlier. So they knew they had qualified. So it really didn't mean that much to them. We obviously were heading for the bottom of that table at that point, uh, by the next game. It's kind of interesting, you know, because a lot of these, you talked about the World Cup coming up and the campaign for that and, it's funny how the newspapers throughout this year are talking about the World Cup and, you know, oh no, we're looking terrible for the World Cup. You know, Scotland win, we're looking good for the World Cup. Oh no, we're looking terrible. But this one, it was kind of one of the quotes that I have is just from Alan Davison in the Glasgow Evening Times. And he's just saying whether John Robertson's legs will carry him to another World Cup is debatable. 
And Charlie Nicholas seems to have lost a touch of sharpness. They earned him so many marvellous goals at Celtic. So I suppose it was kind of prophetic, those words, because obviously Robertson's out for the next game. And Nicholas never quite hit the, the heights we hoped for in the Scotland shot either. What do you think, Clark, uh, from this match? It's really a nothing match that I got no just did a wee bit of research and just seems to be the last game of a few players, but it seems to be that's three, four games I know he's picked a really settled side. I mean the defence seems to be revolving around Miller, McLeish and Goff with maybe a replacement at right back around again. But seems to be building onto that and when I was doing my research I found a interview with Jockstein because there's not really that many interviews with Jockstein. Yeah. And it must be around about this time because he's talking about in two years' time at the World Cup that if he's he's got he've got the best goalkeeping situation the, the country's has had in a long time, got the best defensive situation the country's had in a long time, which is the case of getting the strikers and the midfielders to gel, and we could have a good chance in two years' time. So he's definitely at this stage looking forward to the next World Cup rather than just completely writing off the Euros. McStay at this point was, I'm sure tip to be a future great. Is that correct? Very much so. And for many, I mean, I suppose for Celtic fans, they will see him as a great. For Scotland fans, it's one of those things, because he never travelled outside of Scotland, he turned his crush, shall we say. He's, he's not seen as one of the greats because he never proved himself out with Celtic. That's the same for a lot of players. People think the same as Scott Brown. The great as Scott Brown is, He's never played in England, so there's a kind of, just a way of people looking at it and thinking, hmm, aye, maybe, but not quite, you know. After the 92 Euros, he was tipped to go abroad, but I read somewhere like the only serious offer he got was like from lowly Italian side Udinese, and I guess he was hoping for something better, but that was the only time I ever heard that. There's he apparently been abroad. talks as far back as 1988, even early, earlier than that, apparently Sampdoria were looking at him a few times. Oh, really? Wow. That, seemed to, that seemed to be always one of the, work, the one names he was always linked for. Like, rumours are he was supposed to go there as soon as his replacement. He's supposed to have tipped Sampdoria off about signing him, but never materialised. Then, round about Italia 90, when all the English players, British players were linked with moves to Italy, apparently that surfaced again. Never heard the Udinese one. Yeah. And as you said, 1992 looked to be the closest that he was due to leave Celtic, but then he just changed his mind and stayed. It's just a shame, I think his game would have really went up a few levels if he had just pushed himself a wee bit to go abroad. But he's, from what they've said, he's a very homely man. He's got quite a large family. So I'd probably understand why he wasn't prepared to move. To be a one-club man is also something unique. But like you said, a lot of times it's better to test yourself out with the best in the world. What do you think, Paul, as far as this match or McStay or everything in general? Yeah, McStay's always had a, a really good reputation, but, you know, as, as the guys have said, you know, maybe that move abroad, whether that was to an English club or in Europe, would have just maybe taken him to, to the next level and made him a real international star. I mean, Charlie Nicholas, obviously he came this season to, to England with a really big reputation and, and he had three or four years at Arsenal and he had the League Cup in 87 but never really sort of kicked on in that way when he was in England. So yeah, it, it can work both ways. This game and the, the campaign, obviously you can see it's sort of tail end of a very low crowd at Hamden. There's a lot of um, certainly striking options at this time for Scotland and they're obviously just looking for the best combination. Dodson Sturrock at Dundee United. Got Andy Gray, Graham Sharp coming through at Everton. I don't think he plays this season, but he's going to come into the, the picture quite soon. Archibald, I think Alan Brazil's also at Spurs this season. There's a lot of competition there, so I think it must just have been a case of, of Jock Steen looking for the best best combination there. With this tie, the group was finished and Belgium qualified. There was one more match left in the qualification process the following month against East Germany at Halle. For this match on November 16th against East Germany, Jock Steen selected the following squad. William Thompson of St. Mirren started in goal 
this would be his seventh and final cap. You had Richard Goff, Arthur Albiston, McClish and Miller in defense. Again, Miller started as captain because uh, Sunes was missing again. You had John Wark of Ipswich, Gordon Strachan of Aberdeen starting for the first time in the season. Paul McStay, he replaced by Frank McGarvey in the 60th minute. Kenny Dalglish, Steve Archibald of Tottenham starting for the first time. And Eamon Bannon of uh, Dundee United. As far as this match, East Germany at this point in the qualification process, they had regained some of their form and actually won a few matches against Switzerland, I believe, and that is Scotland. They took the lead in the 33rd minute to Ronald Creer. Ten minutes later, East German veteran Joachim Streich doubled the lead. In the second half, like 10 minutes left, Eamon Bannon pulled the goal back. As far as the match itself, East Germany were dominant. And this was a very, in some ways, an experimental Scottish side. Some players we hadn't seen for some time. East Germany won deservedly, from what I remember. What are your memories from this? And one of the things, if you notice, if you watch the game, is just the, the amount of snow that's on the park. Oh, yeah. And I believe in the under-21 game the night before, it was even worse. I'm surprised. I think had it been a more important game, it may have been postponed, but there's a lot of ice, as I say. I was looking again, going back to the evening times, and Alan Davison, he's saying, Scotland, there was suicidal goalkeeping, naive defending, uncertain midfield play, and poor finishing. I think that happens an awful lot with Scotland. But as far as the press, though, what was their reaction? Because this, again, this is an inconsequential match. I think it, it, it was still that going on about looking to the World Cup campaign and saying, no, we don't have a decent side. We don't have much going for us, you know. It was that kind of way. But as I say, that chopped and changed with each game. You know, how they saw things and how things were going and, yeah, surprisingly, Aberdeen were also doing well in Europe. I'm sort of surprised more of their players weren't selected, but I guess it's his idea of he's trying to gel the players. That's why more were not selected. No, uh, Dundee United were having a good season Dundee. in Europe then. Them, oh, yeah, no, them both, too. No, yeah. both were. Both were. Aberdeen got to the semi finals of the Cup Women's Cup, right. and Dundee United got to the semi finals of the, the European Cup. I think the next game, or one of the next games, is the one where there's going to be a lot of Aberdeen players in the. Oh, yes, the yes, we'll get to, yeah. So, in fact, let's get to that match. So, this was part of the, the British Home Championship. In fact, the final home championship in history. The next match was on December 13th at Belfast against Northern Ireland. We briefly touched up on it on our last podcast on Scotland about the struggles of the home championship for security reasons, financial reasons, etc. There had been governmental pressure to disband the tournament, especially England and Scotland, who did not see any further use for this tournament as far as other than playing each other, none of the other mat- matches against uh, Wales or Northern Ireland brought any money through the gates. Both England and Scotland were willing, but obviously Wales and Northern Ireland were keen to keep this tournament. With that in mind, this was the final home championship. Usually these matches would have taken place in May. This match was brought forward, I guess, to ease fixture congestion. Scotland, again wearing red, were missing John Wark, Dalglish, and Steve Archibald. As we mentioned, for this match, Jock Steen used a lot of Aberdeen players. In fact, he used five Aberdeen players and also Mark McGee, who came on in the second half. So let's go through the lineup. Jim Layton of Aberdeen in goal. Richard Guff of Dundee United. Debutant Douglas Rugby of Aberdeen. This would be his one and only cap. Graham Sunes back capping the side. Uh, in defense, you had McLeish of Aberdeen, Roy Aitken of Celtic, 
Willie Miller's missing first match. Otherwise, there would have been six Aberdeen starters probably. So you have Gordon Strachan starting, Paul McStay, Frank McGarvey of Celtic. He replaced by Mark McGee of Aberdeen in the 60th minute. Davy Dodds of Dundee United. And Peter Weir of Aberdeen. This was his sixth and final cap. His first cap had been in 1980. An experimental side against a fairly decent Northern Ireland side. And let's go through that Northern Ireland side as well. Pat Jennings of Arsenal, Jimmy Nicole of Rangers Glasgow, Mal Donaghy of Luton, John McClelland of Rangers Glasgow, Gerard McElhinney of Bolton, Paul Ramsey of Leicester, George Cochran of Gillingham, he'd be replaced by John O'Neill of Leicester, 86 minute, Sammy McElroy of Stoke, Billy Hamilton of Burnley, Norman Whiteside of Man United, and Ian Stewart of QPR. The match would be won by Northern Ireland. Norman Whiteside would open the scoring in the 17th minute. Actually, Graham Sunnis would score a goal in the 28th minute that was disallowed because Peter Weir fouled on McElhinney in the run-up. In the 56th minute, uh, Northern Ireland would double the lead through McElroy. So once again, a poor result, but an experimental squad again. What was your takeaway from this? I think if you look at it, it's just a rather poor game from a Scotland point of view. Even just in terms of goals they can see, they were kind of poor. Again, it was that the home internationals, was there a feeling in Scotland itself that it was kind of over and done with? I don't know. We look back nowadays with some amount of nostalgia towards it. But at the time, it probably was a game too many. Home internationals in December. Oof. It's yeah. a bit of a stretch. I mean, it, it's interesting. You've got Peter Weir, who's only won six caps, but only two of them came at Aberdeen. Yeah. Where Aberdeen fans would have said he should have been in there a lot more. Um, well, if you look, at, there was a European game against uh, Ipswich, and he just completely tears apart Ipswich. And you're thinking, he's doing it in Europe for Aberdeen. Why is he not doing it for Scotland? But he just could never seem to get himself into the Scotland team. I'm surprised that so many Aberdeen players were selected because I think around this time, they also had a Super Cup final match against Hamburg, I believe, that they yep, would that, win. That would be so, around December, yep. So they were an informed side. However, nowadays, I'm assuming they probably would not have been released with such proximity to an important match. But uh, it looks like as far as the Scottish players, like you said, they probably looked at this home championship, especially in December, as just a nuisance, I'm assuming, right? Like, and they knew it was a last one anyway, so they probably said, okay, let's just get it done with, move on. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah, it does seem like they just weren't prepared uh, to take this much further, that game. As far as Douglas Rugby, he's another player... Maybe you guys would know better. That probably was not international standard or... He's no. one of these players that Fergie really liked. He was one of his boys that he really enjoyed and kind of felt it was un- he was un- he was harshly treated when he was sent off. I think it was the 1979 78 Scottish Cup final where there's supposed to be an altercation between him and Derek Johnson. But if you actually watch the... the there was very little footage of it, but from what the one footage is, there's... He's apparently nowhere near him and Johnson's on the floor, so he's always maintained his innocence. And he just seems to be one of Fergie's boys that he just always looked out for. And then he sold him on. He didn't, it just didn't work for him in England. But hard right. man, but not. I don't think he was really international class compared to what got available. I don't think, I think Goff being a lot younger was probably a better option than him. If Albison was fit for this match, probably rugby would not have started. I think it's just Big, a case of a fullback as well, wasn't he? Yep. Unusual size for a fullback. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. I mean, it is unusual that the Scotland side is made up of 10 home players and only Graham Soonis from down south. Particularly when you've got Dundee and Aberdeen, Dundee United and Aberdeen doing so well in Europe, you would have thought they might have mixed it up a bit, but I don't know what he's thinking was there. 
I think at this by this point, as, as you say, Sean, I think both England and Scotland had more or less given up on the, the home championship and it was really only the meeting of those two that, I think that's that was the game that concerning them. Yeah. yeah. The calendar year ended again on a low note. So in general, it was a poor calendar year. Continuing in a home championship, the first match of the new year was on February 28th at Glasgow at Hampden Park. Again, a very low crowd of just over 21,000 when Scotland took on Wales. I uh, think for- uh, at this point, Hampden was getting redeveloped because I've watched videos and it seems to be the North Stands getting redeveloped at the time. So that's probably a reason why the crowds were very low. Oh, that's the reason. Like oh. Change strike that particular day. Was that not the following year of the Yugoslavia game? No. No, there's a train strike, definitely. Oh, for yeah. sure? Oh, It's, this, not, it's all over the papers, you know, and Hamden is one of the, the grounds where you definitely generally get a train to, yeah. unless you want to walk to. Was it customary to go on strike on football day matches, <laughs> expecting the crowds and all that? This is the 1980s. It was customary just to go on strike. Oh. <laughs> Well, that would be more than 1970s, I suppose. But, you know, we're talking about the height of Thatcherism, so there's a lot of union versus government things going on. So there's a lot of these undercurrents that's causing these strikes and things. And in a way, the more disruption, the better sometimes for these as well. So if it disrupts a a football crowd, that's that's part of it as well. For the match itself, Jock Steen selected the following side. Jim Layton starting in goal, Richard Goff, Arthur Albison in defense, McLeish and Miller in defense, Graham Souness captaining the side, Paul Starrock of Dundee United, first appearance of the season, Paul McStay starting, he'd be replaced by Roy Aitken in the 64th minute, Frank McGarvey playing his seventh and final cap. His first cap had been in 1979. He'd be replaced by debutante Morris Johnson of Watford in the 46th minute. James Bett of Lokeren and Davy Cooper of Rangers starting for the first time in the season. Now let's go through the Wells lineup as well. You had Neville Southall of Everton, Jeff Hopkins, Fulham, Joe Jones of Chelsea, Kenny Jacket of Watford, Jeremy Charles of QPR, Kevin Ratcliffe, Everton, Robbie James, Stoke, Brian Flynn, Burnley, Ian Rush, Liverpool. He'd be replaced by Gordon Davies of Fulham in the 64th minute, Mickey Thomas of Chelsea, Alan Curtis of Southampton, and Paul Price of Tottenham in the 84th minute. For this match, it was, an, again, an uh, inspiring match. Scotland took the lead in the 37th minute through Cooper with a penalty kick. Robbie James tied the match early in the second half in the 47th minute. And debutant Morris Johnson scored Scotland's winner in the 78th minute. Another point to make is that Kenny Dalglish was missing. Nicholas, again, wasn't starting. Strachan. No Strachan, that's right. As far as the match itself, any takeaways? Well, I was obviously quite excited to be going because um, Mo Johnson had left Partick Thistle in November and had gone to Watford. At the time, Partick Thistle were top of the league. It was a Scottish first division. Um, it would take us another 10 years to get out of it after we sold them. He'd gone to Watford and he'd been an instant success. He would score 20 goals in 29 league games that year. He would also take part in an FA Cup final. I was quite excited to see him, you know, because we'd followed him at Fur Hill. We'd seen his first game, his first goal and things like that. But, you know, he did make an instant impact. Not just the goal, but some of his play as well. He is kind of surprising because you've got that, you've got the height of Nicholas and then you've got Mo Johnson underneath that. Not much hype about him. I mean, he only went to Watford for 200000 but certainly made an impact. 
and he would make an even bigger impact the following season. Uh, Paul, do you remember if Morris Johnson at this time at the English League, if uh, there was a lot of hype about him or he just was under the radar? Uh, certainly when he arrived, he, he was under the radar. But you know, as, as David said, he had a, a really good season. That was the only season I think they went to South yeah, I think he was the South next season. Yeah. The yeah. season. And obviously he was around the Scotland team then for several years and scored goals wherever he went. But yeah, when, when he arrived, he was one of those signings that people didn't know a lot about and had a, had a great season. Yeah, with George Riley up front, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, the, the big man, yeah, yeah. yeah. Was selection of Davy Cooper a surprise at this point? I suppose it's that thing. You think about it, he's, he's tried John Robertson, you know, after a few years, and he's decided, no, he's not for me. He's brought back Peter Weir and he's decided he's not for me. So he's went with Cooper, who we all know is a great player, but he wasn't a consistent player. He never was at any point in his career. But uh, he's came in and, you know, fair dues to him. He gets up and he takes that penalty. You know, your first game in two and a half years, you take the penalty. It was interesting, I noticed that, you know, he put the ball in the spot and then the ref came and moved the ball. Not quite somebody nobbled the penalty spot like their game the other night there, but, you know, it didn't put him off. Davy Cooper's, was his best era maybe when Sooners had just joined player manager at Rangers? Cooper had somewhat of a renaissance at the time, right? Playing in, in a pretty poor Rangers team yeah. for a number yeah. of years. You know, and he had his Indian summer when he was at Motherwell, where everybody seems to say, well, from a non Rangers perspective, they all seem to agree that was probably his best period right. playing because he was the star man in a team and he was, there was no pressure on him. He just seemed to be that's when he was playing his best football. What season was that? Mm, that would have been about. 80, 80, 80, 80, 89 ish. Oh, just totally. Okay. Right. Right after his just, range. Just, just before, just around, because he was even talking, he was going to go to the World Cup in 1990 because his form was so yeah. good. And as far as Frank McGarvey, this was his final cap. He'd been at Liverpool, but he'd not lived up to expectations a few seasons before. He had regained his form at Celtic. Uh, do you remember his Liverpool years, Paul? No, I think he, he was someone he, he did have a bit of a. A reputation when he arrived. Um, obviously, Bob Paisley, I think he was at the time, had signed quite a few players successfully from Scotland. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And I think Ian Rush was just starting to emerge maybe around the same time. I was reading that David Johnson had a great season that year. Yeah, that David Johnson as well. And I think it was Rush Ian just Rush, was the least, There was a number yeah. of players. Because McGarvey apparently was scoring quite a bit in the reserves and he there was talk of him staying on but he wanted to move he wanted to play football he didn't want to yeah. be in the reserves because people were saying no no this is Liverpool you sometimes have to be a couple of years to get a game you know yeah and, and that's and no, I think he just decided no that's, I'm not good at it McGarvey was a great player though I mean he, unpredictable as anything ball at his feet he you weren't sure which direction he was going to go but you know, he knew how he scored. But it never worked out for him from Scotland. But again, it may be just that timing thing. You know, he's come off at half time. Mo Johnson's went on. Johnson has scored. You know, and that's maybe the big difference. That's why maybe he was forgotten about. No, we've got somebody else now. Next match would be three months later. They would face England on May 26th, a very final home championship match in history. We've kind of touched up on this match in our England podcast. This match would be at Hampton Park and with a very good crowd of over 73,000. For this match, Jock Steen selected the following squad. Jim Layton goal, Goff and Albiston in defense, McClish and Miller, Miller capping the side again with uh, Graham Sunis missing. John Wark of Liverpool. He had joined Liverpool in the midseason from Ipswich. At Gordon Strachan, he'd be replaced by Paul McStay in the 63rd minute. Steve Archibald of Tottenham. 
Mark McGee of Aberdeen. He'd be replaced by Mo Johnson in the 63rd minute. James Bett of Lokeren and Davy Cooper of Rangers Glasgow. Daglish was missing, I think, the Champions Cup final against Rome yeah. was only a few days away. So it's, it's one of those things in the, the newspapers when the squad was announced, it says Daglish and Sunis won't be playing because they're playing the European Cup. No mention of Alan Hansen won't be playing because he's in the oh, European yeah. Cup. He was just forgotten about. He was. He wasn't even quoted. Yeah, we haven't mentioned him yet for this year. Because at this point, yeah, at this point, McClush and Miller were the yeah the central defensive partnership. Like you said, Hansen was the forgotten man at this point. John Wark, even though he was a Liverpool player, I'm assuming he was probably cup tied. That's why. That's what I would assume as well. Yeah. yeah. As far as a defensive partnership, Jock Steen has settled on. Goff and Albiston on the flanks and uh, McClish and Miller. And that's the formation he's been using the entire season. Obviously, Sunes and Daglish are certainties, it seems like, but the other positions are kind of fluctuating. Going back to the match itself, as far as the England lineup, you had Peter Schiffman of Southampton, Mike Duxbury of Man United, Kenny Sansom of Arsenal, Terry Fennick of QPR, Graham Roberts of Tottenham, Ray Wilkins, Man United, Mark Chamberlain of Stoke, he replaced by Stephen Hunt of West Bromwich, out in the 75th minute, Brian Robson, captain the side from Man United, John Barnes of Watford, Luther Blissett of AC Milan, Tony Woodcock of Arsenal, he'd be replaced by debutant Gary Lineker of Leicester in the 73rd minute. As far as England, the historical aspect of this is the debut of Lineker. The match itself, Scotland would take the lead in the 13th minute. David Cooper took a corner that Shilton punched clear. Strachan would take possession and send it back into the box where Mickey would head it in. England would tie the match in the 37th minute through Tony Woodcock. The match stayed as a diplomatic tie, I would say. And uh, in fact, neither team actually won the, the home championship that season. It was Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland who won, right. And the final home championship match that I guess had started in 1884. Is that the first year of a home championship? I could be wrong. So almost, uh, I guess, a century of a tournament Mm -hmm. ended. And we will get into this for future podcasts that uh, obviously Scotland and England will continue with the Rouse Cup, but that's a whole different issue. But as far as this, what was the positives from Scotland's performance? Certainly looking at some of the highlights, David Cooper is playing really well. You've got Mo Johnson's come on in the second half and he, he has a terrific volley that, you know, Peter Shelton makes a great save from. Um, certainly, Scotland seemed to finish the stronger. Um, bit disappointing that the Woodcock goal, though. You know, to think Miller's got his back to him and he's trying to keep him away from the goal, but, you know, it gives him the space and the time. But no, it, it was, you know, quite a positive performance in many ways, given what's been before, you know. But again, it was a kind of you know, well, that's the end of this. <laughs> the home internationals with Northern Ireland winning it. Also, didn't England go on a pretty grueling tour of South America right after this? Yes. So they yes. They probably had one eye on that. It was clear to see that, I guess, Mo Johnson was going to have an extended run after his performance as well. The season wasn't over yet. Just four days later, in fact, on the same day of the Champions Cup final, on May 30th, at Marseille, Scotland took on future Euro winners France. France were preparing for the Euros that they were going to host. At this point, Michel Platini was perhaps the best player in, in Europe, maybe even the world. Scotland, again, missing the Liverpool contingent of uh, Daglish and Sunes. Albison was also missing. 
So you had Jim Layton starting, Richard Goff. He'd be replaced by Charlie Nicholas of Arsenal in the 67th minute. Ray Stewart of West Ham starting. And I can't recall when was his last cap, maybe in the previous season. Willie Miller, Alex McLeish, Morris Malpas of Dundee United earning his first cap for Scotland. Gordon Strachan, he'd be replaced by Aberdeen's Neil Simpson, 46 minute. John Wark of Liverpool. Steve Archibald of Tottenham on his way to Barcelona, joining Terry Venables for the following season. James Bett of Lokeren and Mo Johnson of Watford. Going through the France lineup, Joel Batz of Auxerre, Patrick Battiston of Bordeaux, Yvonne Leroux of Monaco, Maxim Bosis of Nantes, Manuel Amoros of Monaco, Alain Gires of Bordeaux, Jean Tigana of Bordeaux, Michel Platini capping the side from Juventus, Luis Fernandez of Paris Saint-Germain, He'd be replaced by Bernard Gengini of Monaco in the 67th minute. Bernard Lacombe of Bordeaux. He'd be replaced by Daniel Bravo of Monaco, 46th minute. Bruno Bellon of Monaco. He'd be replaced by DDS6 of Mulhouse in the 67th minute. DDS6 would join Aston Villa, in fact, in the following season. Excellent French side. They would predictably go on and win 2-0. Alain Jures would open the scoring in the 14th minute. Bernard Lacombe would score the second in the 29th minute. Scotland were once again wearing the red kit. I believe it was two going on five or six. It was, it was that. Possibly, yeah. The French outclassed them. It's interesting to see that the French that particular year played 12 games, won all 12. Yes. There can't be many international teams that have done that. No. no. Um, of the starting 11 against Scotland, all 11 play in the final. Uh, yes. I think Amaros is a sub in the final, but yes, all 11 yes. do play. So it's not so they had an experimental Which, side out. One of those games, shame and lose, and you've lost a team who are going into a tournament and going to win it. And there's no absolutely zero shame in this game. Nah, yes. They're going to win it in style because they, they yep. beat Belgium 5 0 on the way to the final. Yeah. You know, Very uh, strong <laughs> French side, yeah. It's uh, an amazing French side. Of course, Mo, Mo Johnson would get him back a couple of years down the line. You know what Ham did. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing is, David Cooper's not there. He is going to Australia to play football with Rangers who are doing a tour that year. And it was just one of those asides in the newspaper that actually the bad luck Rangers were having because um, one of the players, Bobby Williamson, had came in for a night out and broke his leg at the hotel. And then playing Australia, Colin McAdam, his leg was broken by David Mitchell, who would play with Rangers as well. So, so they didn't have much luck on that tour. Yeah, I guess we've discussed it before. Around this time, Rangers were clearly not the dominant side that they would be further down in the decade. At this point, it was Aberdeen, Celtic, and even Dundee United that were winning domestically. Uh, well, what Rangers, Rangers are doing it, Rangers at this point are building their stadium. That's where all their money went at this point. Is this not the season that they finished fifth or something and missed out in Europe? It's like the yeah, one season. I think St. Mirren pipped them to Europe or something. I think they qualified for Europe because I know, I think, did they play Inter the following season in the UEFA Cup? 84-85? Not sure. I know it's, it's right about this time they do, they do have a season where they miss out in Europe. Not the Anglo Scottish Cup, don't they? Looks like they tried five at the back in this game as well, maybe to combat the the French. I think Goff probably playing in the middle there, which is well, that was his position Steen's, later on, isn't it? Yeah. It seems to be Steen's type of formation. We don't play. It looks like he's playing five at the back, but he's really playing one as a sweeper midfielder. Okay. Mm. Yeah. See, that was a pretty common trait with him. Yeah, Ray Stewart of West Ham. He would play every few years. He would get a cap, but I guess he was never really... I only really consistent. know him that he managed St. Uh, Sterling Albion, the, I think it was the 1990s or something. That's about the only thing I know him for. And then he he for a a yeah, he used to score a lot of penalties. Yeah, I think it's something like yeah. 80, maybe 84 or something like that. Yeah. 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 
A lot of them. Yeah. Scotland as well. And as far as Malpas, I guess this was a long-awaited cap, perhaps because of Dundee United's run in Europe and their title win the previous season. And he would have a long career in Scottish colours. And uh, quite fitting he made his debut against France because he's he's all French descent. He did play in the ninety-two Euros. Is that correct? I don't yes. know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Was that yeah, the end of his? Part- no, he had a he had a couple more. I, th- I think he officially retired about two thousand ish, but his Scotland career kind of ended in nineteen ninety four in the back of the dismal World Cup qu- campaign. Oh right, kind of right. Never. But no, he had he had established himself in nineteen ninety two. I right. think he established himself with the Scotland team the following year or the year right. after. The season ended, and uh, like we said, there had not been much at stake to begin with the entire season, with everything being in line for the following year for the World Cup qualifiers. Again, we kind of touched up on this. It seemed like Jock Steen had settled on his defensive formation with Leighton Goal, Goff, Albiston, McClish and Miller. It was only midfield and up front with few positions where nothing was set. James Bett is starting a lot of matches this season. I think it was midway through the following season where he would join Aberdeen, right? I think. Uh, yeah, rough. I'd say rough a bit then. Yep, he was always one of these yeah. class act players that really liked, but just seemed to he's got the brunt of the blame for the game against Costa Rica in 1990, and that just kind of really ended his Scotland career. And it's a rarity of a Scottish player to be overseas, especially at Belgium around this time. Yep. So I think I think he was used to because I think he. Been in Iceland before, and I think he'd met his wife in Iceland. I think he actually lives in Iceland now, from if I remember reading re- recently. Right. I think he's one of these guys. He's happy to go abroad. Surprisingly, this didn't disqualify him from Scotland selection because a lot of times, around this time, if for most nations, if players went abroad, that was their end of their international career. But I guess. He was well. We've got in Joe Jordan's book. He says when he got the chance to join AC Milan, was the first thing he asked. Steen was, will this affect my Scotland place? And I think the impression he got was, if you're playing abroad, Steen won't see you because he's not really one for going abroad to watch players. He'll just go and hear say. So I think that's probably a true case that he's not going to look at players abroad. But I don't think there was really many at the time. He made one or two in France and a couple in Germany, but it right. seemed to be everybody just headed straight for England at this point. Mark McGee would join Hamburg in the off-season. That Even was in the it, back of the Cup Winners Cup, the uh, Super Cup. Right. Him and Bracken were supposed to go as well. I think he was supposed to join Cologne. Yeah, that was a lot of, that was a big news story at the time. I remember that Strachan is about to join Cologne. I guess in the last minute he was yeah, I think it ended up costing Aberdeen a lot of money because I think we took it to court or something like that. And I think that stems from why Strachan and Ferguson kind of fell yes. out of each other. As far as the takeaways from the season, what are what do you guys generally think? I think it's just a case of get the home nations out of the way and just really get to the World Cup draw and that's it. Just the Euros is written off and there's no point busting a gut for nothing. We'll just get the home nations out of the way and then we can fully concentrate on the World Cup and probably the hope Nicholas will find his feet at, at Arsenal and hopefully he'll come good and then you've got I think it looks like it's just kind of came out of the blue that Johnson, uh, Johnson's appeared and that's probably a, something that's pleased probably one of the highlights of the year has a has sudden burst onto the scene. When the season started, it probably didn't look like that Mo Johnson was going to have this kind of an impact, right? Yeah, he, was, he was still with Thistle in the Scottish First Division. Who we had taught, as I said, he was part of the under-21 squad. So, you know, so he was known. But... I, as I said, I think the, the hype around Nicholas had allowed him to go under the radar as such. And because he was coming from a team like Partick Thistle, there wasn't that much expected of him. But his work rate was always first class. You know, he, he was always worked hard, played for the team and things like that. Despite the controversy that happens years later when he joins Rangers and then joins just about everybody else after that. Hearts, Falkirk, Everton... 
Yeah, he's doing well with Saint Mirren around about this point, and he goes down south, and nobody really knows who he is. And even in Scotland, it's a okay, case so he doesn't get near the team, and he would have to wait about two years. Macavene. Aye. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the things I'm looking, I've got, you know, one of the under-21 squads from round about this is for the East Germany game. And can I just read the team, the players who are there? Sure. Eric Black, Aberdeen. Stevie Clark, St Mirren. Neil Cooper, Aberdeen. Ian Ferguson, Dundee. Gary Gillespie, Liverpool. Brian Gunn, Aberdeen. John Hewitt, Aberdeen, Mo Johnson, Partick Thistle, Brian McClare, Celtic, Tosh McKinley, Dundee, David McPherson, Rangers, Morris Malpass, Dundee United, Ralph Milne, Dundee United, Steve Nicol, Liverpool, John Robertson, Hearts, Neil Simpson, Aberdeen, Nicky Walker, Motherwell, and Colin Walsh, Nottingham Forest. I mean, I could barely name any of the Scotland under-21 team at the moment. But that is a really strong, a strong team. Squad. And a, lot, yeah. a lot of them would go on to full international status as well. Quite yeah. a few there who just kind of get a cap or two, but pretty well known within the Scottish League. Eric Black would play in Mets in France, but did he ever get a full Scottish cap? I think he, he got, got two caps. Yeah, to, to, but to he had to. major he had major back problems because it's one of the things a lot of the players will say about Fergie. Maybe drilled the players a bit a bit too much, and a lot of them have kind of got back in, back issues later on. He says he got back pains and was it just hampered his career. And I think he only recently got it fully diagnosed. That he had a hairline crack in his spine, wow. so it's only fairly recently he's had that treated. But he missed it in a good career. And of course, John Hewitt is an Aberdeen legend for scoring against Real Madrid. Yep. He's one of these players where everybody thinks he's a sub, but he actually started quite a lot of games. And he was... I was doing some research and I found a newspaper article where he's on the verge of the Scotland squad around about 1988-ish. He just misses out. Ralph Milne is another one. You know, he's one of those ones that people always mention as somebody who should have had a cap. He's another one where he had his personal demons, didn't he? Yeah, alcohol issues, yeah. And Neil Cooper also passed away just in the last couple of years, I believe, right? Yeah, a couple yeah. of years ago. Uh, yeah. had a heart, I think it was a heart attack he died of. Yeah. He was actually, there. I found a newspaper clipping from just about a decade ago. He saying he was on, it was, Steena told him it was between him, Neil Simpson and Paul McStay who was going to start besides Sunnis in the 1986 qualifiers. And it looked like at the last minute Cooper might get the chance. And then on the night, Steen said he was going to go with McStay. And McStay never really looked back after that. The list you mentioned, a lot of good players on that list. Who would... A lot of strength and depth around this time as well. A lot, lot of options for, for Scotland. Judging Jockstein, I think he had the most talented squad available of any manager at any point. And... We didn't quite achieve that much. Liverpool doing well in Europe and Aberdeen, he, was, he could never really get a really settled. So I think if he had, had his ideal team, it would have been Nicholas and Douglas up front, Sunis playing every game and all that. But it just seems to be he'll miss Sunis now and again. Douglas will go quite a while without between games and it's just not working with Nicholas down south. So I think that played a part in it. You know, it's obviously I've been going through some newspapers at the time, and I think one of the ones in October, November, it's talking about Doug Leach for Celtic and David Hay talking about trying to sign him. And then by February, it becomes a uh, Doug Leach for Rangers. <laughs> but he still had a good few years at um, Liverpool to go as well. I noticed Alan Brazil did not play a single match this season, and he was on the verge of joining Man United. I think domestically he had a pretty decent season for Tottenham. He's one think. of these players where he seems to be a good league player, but just seems to be. I just think he was called into the Scotland squad and just Steen just didn't take a liking to him. That's just as simple as that, I think. Mm-hmm. And I think he's just one of these guys where he's made a career out of the media and everybody just thinks I think was a lot better than what he really was. He's developed this reputation. Really, he's never done it in a Scotland shirt and. 
he had the potential probably to do something, but just never did it. Yeah, Andy Gray as well. I don't think he's played this season, and uh, again, never seems to have made a massive impact for for Scotland. Would it be, be fair to say? You know, where he's a pretty effective player in England for for many years, million pound player at the time. He was never given consistent play. Do you know, mm. well, that was because he, he's another one that suffered injuries at times as well. You know, so where that stopped that consistency happening. But I, it was always kind of like, well, who's lining up besides Douglas? And we do go through a lot at this point, you know, because you do have Andy yeah. Green, you do have Alan Brazil, you do have Brian McClure's going to come into it soon, Graham Sharp. Yeah. Alan McAnally's just moved to Celtic at the end of this season. You know, so there's players coming in who are going to, in the next few years, come on for Scotland, but not actually yeah. score. Oh, he's still, but this will be the start of his he starts getting going soon. McCoyst is in one of the later under-21 squads as well. You suddenly see his name. But there was talk of him going back to Sunderland as, it, it well, as well at one point. You know, Sunderland were in for him. Because uh, he was struggling a wee bit with the Rangers side as well. He didn't quite make the impact straight away with Rangers. He didn't um, even when Sunis was there, he had a, num- a few number of years where he was... He doesn't really get going to yeah, I think he has like one good season under Wallace, but really he doesn't get going until a bit much later in the 80s. Were you surprised when Archibald joined Barcelona? Archibald is a strange one. I mean, he's a great player, but he's a single-minded player, isn't he? You know, his first thought was always, I'm going to try and hit target. You know, and that's why he scored so many, but it's also probably why in a team like Scotland, the ones that he, you know, you think, oh, you could have passed there, you could have done that. But no, he was quite, quite single-minded to my... And he, he done well with Barcelona. I think it's one of these things where you can laugh on it just now, but end of the day, he went there as Maradona's replacement and the Barcelona fans grew to love him and they still, still to this day, they love him. So he must have done something right out there. Yeah, no, his first season, they won the league. I think he scored like 15 goals. He had a very good first season there. He would be on the fringes of the squad and be there for like another four years. But once uh, Johan Cruyff took over, then he sold them off. That time, I think it was, two, it was only two foreigners in Spain. So. Right, right, yeah. If you remember when Hughes and Lineker joined, Archibald and Schuster were dropped to the second team. Then he made a comeback for end of the season, 86, 87. But then again, I think he was loaned to Blackburn and before he was eventually sold off. He only really played his first couple of seasons in Barcelona. But they were good seasons. But uh, like you said, internationally, he was never really made the impact that uh, one would have hoped. The group that they were gonna that Scotland were gonna be in at this point, it was obvious that it was gonna be Spain, Wales, and Iceland. Spain would go on and reach the final of the Euros that summer. So, did that give you guys a cause for concern as Scotland fans that uh, maybe Spain were gonna be a tough opponent? Bearing in mind that only one team could directly qualify, and there would be a uh, playoff and we all know how the story went with that group but uh, at this point what was the feeling? I don't think cause we, we did have tremendous players, may not have had tremendous results but we always had tremendous players at this point so you think in Iceland that isn't too difficult Wales, well they have just beaten them, you know so you're thinking yeah we could do Wales, Spain hmm who knows? Um, I mean, know how that went, you know. But I, I don't think it was a group to fear because, you know, there was the playoff thing as well, which was always, always a possibility. You know, it's, it's not like the seventies where if you come second, you there's no second prize. You know, you you're not getting to the World Cup. So I would um, imagine the the Euros were probably still strongly in the mind so that would have had an impact but that seems just to be completely forgotten about as soon as we play Iceland at Hamden. In fact Paul has told me that um, the Euros were not even shown in England so maybe the, the Scot- Scottish public probably even realised Spain were in the final. Who I think knows? there was yeah. one group game shown 
Right. Then they showed like one of the quarterfinals, but it was only the first half they showed to switch to England Brazil, right. and then it really was only the final that was shown. Right. So yeah, not a chance to really see Spain apart from the right. final. Right. So the Scottish football public probably were maybe didn't have that much of a concern because they probably were not too familiar with Spain. I would think. If they're thinking about Spain, they're probably thinking them because of the World Cup two years before, rather than the current team. Yeah, but Northern Ireland beat them. Mm-hmm. Oh yes, yes. Uh, Paul, what do you think generally of the season? Yeah, it's a, it's a difficult season with the the European Championship qualifications more or less gone the previous season. So it's 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 an awkward one really of you know just preparing like we said for the the World Cup qualifiers and not not even too many friendlies to sort of experiment with. I suspect nowadays you'd be fitting in a few more games there and maybe an end of season tour. I was doing my research I was just shocked how little games there was and you know, thinking, yeah. right, maybe you might have tried different things, but it just seems to be a really settled team the whole way through the year. So there's not even much to go on. And you see even in the friendlies that there's, there's relatively few substitutions as well. You know, nowadays you'd be... Looking at so yeah, probably six or seven, and you know, you know you've only got one or two there. It really is a different way of organising your your team and your your squad. Completely different. But again, I think it's a case of you look at the club scene in Scotland. It's really healthy. That you've got averaging the Super Cup winners, and they've reached the semi-finals of the European Cup, losing to Porto, and you've got Dundee United reaching the semi-finals of the European Cup, beating Roma, and get cheated out of the second leg. And they're thinking they've got the final against Liverpool in the bag, but don't get it. Yeah, it's the most competitive Scottish Premier in the living memory, just about, isn't it? Isn't it? And um, you know, when you add the the players that you've got right at the top of the first division with with Liverpool and Manchester United and Spurs, is looking at it, you know, it's it's one of the the strongest pools of players I think that you know Scotland have had for a long time. Were there any players at this point from the Scottish League that were tipped to join the English League at this point? Transfer approaches that perhaps didn't go through? Because only Strachan left to Man United. Strachan, McGee, they left. Archibald. Archibald um, moved on. Eventually, Johnson. I don't think Celtic and Rangers sold many players to England at this point. And then the United, they oh, seemed they had all their yeah. players tied down because there was always the stories that Jim McLean, when he signed a player, had them down on 10, 15 year contracts. So they, this was pre Bosman, so they couldn't just walk off. It was golf a couple of years away and obviously late and eventually, but yeah, not, not so much. Maybe that, that movement's already slowing down a little bit. Stevie Clark would go to Chelsea in a few years, wouldn't he? Oh, yeah, that, oh, yes. that's right. And Rugby as well, like we said as well. Rugby's the only one I can think of that really kind of went. Yeah, that's right. Any players that you think deserved a call-up that maybe didn't get a call-up at this season? Probably the only kind of one that kind of comes to mind is Stevie Nicol, but he would make his debut the following season because he's in the Liverpool team that made the European Cup final and they've been there a couple of years. I guess at this point, Gary Gillespie was in Coventry still, right? Or he had just joined Liverpool. I don't think he was at Liverpool. At this I was point, at Liverpool. Yeah. Oh, he was at Liverpool. He was part of that under twenty one squad. Right, right. Liverpool. So he was in the first team. He's in one. I think it was a few years before he even get in the other team. So it is a strong squad, and despite the fact that they struggled, fans today probably wish they had a team like this today. You know, right now. So at this, with that much experience. But, no, uh, I can't imagine there'd only be twenty one thousand turning up to see. This team <laughs> today. <laughs> yeah. well, what would give for like the Gaggio game on Friday night? What would give for injury uh, striking problems like that? Yeah, <laughs> all form at Cheltenham, and Arsenal, Kenny Douglas playing a European Cup final. So the following season would not settle everything. There would be some good performances, some poor performances. You could see that there, there was going to be some improvement. Maybe the takeaway is that Scotland raised their game because it was a World Cup qualification. Yeah. Maybe if this had been this 82-84 stretch had also been a World Cup qualification, maybe they would have raised their game further, but who knows? 
I'd imagine the World Cup draw would have been made early, 84, so they probably would have known what was coming by the time we got to the, home, the England game. Yeah, it, I guess it would have been, I'm thinking, in December of 83 at the latest, where the draw would have been made yeah. for the qualifiers. So they would have had, a, obviously, a few months down the road. But, I mean, you know, you're only thinking of what's ahead of you at that moment. So you don't really even get your mind ready for it. I'm speaking as a fan. Until mm-hmm. when actually the matches start, when you see the teams play, I'm sure the coaches and administrators think differently than the fans. Well, another so, yeah. thing, that game against France, that would have been Jim McLean's last game as assistant manager. Yeah, right. that's right. He would be replaced during the summer. Any final thoughts? I, su- I suppose what Clark's just saying there is Jim McLean quit as the assistant manager. But if he don't think, there, well, I think it was he had a fall in the FFA and he just thought it was best if he stood aside. That was the newspaper cut, and I found that he's apparently had a 15 game ban from the SFA. Right. And that's the reason why he stood aside. And then, of course, it'll be, there was a more worthy replacement coming in for the following season. 15 matches. What exactly have you done? I think just fell. I think it just touchline ban. It was all I could find was that why he was replaced, Alex Ferguson, was because of a touchline ban. So I'd imagine he's had an argument with a referee or he's been arguing with the SFA over something. Yeah, that's <laughs> so a does seem, ban. It does, yeah. seem to, it does seem to be he's done something that's got quite a lengthy touchline ban. Right. I was thinking, yeah, must have maybe. Probably something verbal abuse, who knows, to referee. He turned down the, the Rangers job that year as well. At the early, I think, late in 83. Ferguson, turned, Ferguson, I think him and Ferguson were linked with it 84-ish, so we're doing around about this time. Yeah. David, any final thoughts on the season? I think it's that thing, you know, we talk about preparing for the World Cup, but if you had a decent start in the year, European Nations Cup, we would have been talking about that, you know. I just think we let ourselves go, you know, because we didn't do well. That, oh, it's just the Euros. I think that was the thoughts at the time, you know. But in years to come, it, it is a big thing. We look forward to it. As you say, you know, it, it's just trying to get them to play consistently. The nucleus of the team is there. You know, you've got Lee and you've got Miller, you've got McLeish. You're going to have Malpass, you're going to have Goff. I mean, it's hard to believe the Goff's a right back at this point because he's he's such a commanding centre half as well. You've got Strachan, you've got Sunish, you've got Douglas. As you say, it's maybe just who else you get in there. The sad thing as well is that that's John Work finished, does it not? He played his mm-hmm. final game against France. I think um, he, no, I think he's got one more cap, but I think he right. broke his leg around about this time. And he kind of fell out the Liverpool side as well because he had a great first season with Liverpool, I think, didn't he? The top goal scorer was at his second season. And then I think he's, there's a online poll, 100 players have shaked the cop, and I think he comes in at like number 99, something like that. So I think he is quite fondly remembered by the Liverpool fans. And then, of course, he's got his film career coming up as well, hasn't he? Escape to victory. Uh, no, that's, that's a good few years before this. That's about yeah, 81. That was 81, right? 80, 81. Yeah. Victory, yeah. right. But Work was a great player. He, he's one of those players you just love to see in a Scotland strip. And he, it's hard to believe we only saw him 28 times when you see the, the goals that he scored. I mean, I think he was, was he one of the European young European players of the year at one point. The Bravo Award. I think that would have been in 81 if he did. Yeah, the Bravo War, yeah. He's just one of those players I would love to have seen more. He had a long career as well when he, he went back to Ipswich later on. I think he was still playing at the start of the Premier League for, for Ipswich. Right, right. 92-93 so right. right. season, yeah, he was at Ipswich, yeah. I remember, yeah. And yeah. still scoring goals as well as I remember, yeah. yeah. What do you think, Paul, as far as the season? Yeah, d- difficult... Um, uh, circumstances to, to probably get get motivated for a season where there's nothing really at stake like this, and you know we'll we'll see in the the next year though that there are some promising signs for what's coming ahead. And McStay's come into the team, and Mo Johnston, who we've mentioned quite a bit, I would guess are probably the biggest 
pluses there and having a, a strong, settled defence as well. Once again, we would like to thank Mr. Stewart and Mr. Gillis for their continuous participation in this series. And uh, as always, feel free to leave questions and comments for us. You may contact myself on my blog, on Twitter, I'm on SP1873, and on Facebook, I'm under Soccer Nostalgia. Mr. Paul Whittle can be contacted on Twitter at 1888letter. You may also follow the podcast on Spotify under Soccer Nostalgia Talk Podcast. Mr. Stewart can be contacted on Twitter at DAVSTU11. And you can also check out his website, scotlandepistoles.com. Mr. Gillis can be contacted on Twitter at Wanderer1982. And again, all this information will be on the blog link as well as the Spotify link. Once again, I want to thank you gentlemen for your participation and looking forward to the next season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.